Motor cars were designed to provide a new form of personal transport. But before long, they were used for other purposes. This car, with more than 100 others, took part in one of the early motor races run between the great cities of Europe, the Paris-Vienna 1902. And the new cinematograph is there to record its dusty progress. Most of these cars are standard touring models and are driven by gentlemen who are only too pleased to show off their new machines. But there are also many specially built racing cars made to an internationally accepted weight limit of one ton. Manufacturers build faster and faster cars by putting larger and larger engines in light chassis. These cars, capable of speeds of up to 90 miles an hour, give some of the most exciting and dangerous racing ever known. France at this time is supreme, and here comes one of her greatest drivers, the Chevalier René de Nif on his Panard. But the great de Nif fails to finish the Paris-Vienna race, and an Englishman, S.F. Edge, takes the coveted Gordon Bennett Trophy to Britain. The Irish Gordon Bennett is a real international competition, with teams from Germany, the United States, Britain and France. is over seven laps of a closed circuit. Only a few weeks ago, the city-to-city -city races had come to a terrible halt after a disastrous attempt to run a race from Paris to Madrid. The race is to be run over a total distance of 327 miles, and the Panard, driven by Denis, is confidently expected to take the trophy back to France. the unexpected is happening once more, and a German Mercedes driven by Janazzi is faster. Commonly called the Red Devil, Janazzi is better known for courage than success. But at last, his day has come. French cars are second, third, and fourth. But the Gordon Bennett Trophy goes on to Germany. Janazzi's erratic brilliance does much to make Mercedes the car of the year. Next year, special trials are needed to select Gordon Bennett teams, as more and more manufacturers realize that racing is a shortcut to fame. British hopes are centered on Edge's Napier. Tires are a great problem and have to be cooled whenever possible. Britain also has new streamlined Wolseleys. The German team is to be led by Genetzi, the undoubted favorite. While the Italians have Cagno, their queen's personal chauffeur. The Germans have chosen the Taunus, building fantastic stands to look like a medieval castle, and even translating the inscriptions in the post office into Latin. On this grand occasion, the Kaiser himself is up at six in the morning for the start. Nazi leads off for Germany. Edge follows. Janazzi is determined to win. He has been practicing every day for two months. The circuit is 80 miles, with towns that are neutralized. Cars stop and are then paced through by cyclists. 
It is noted that the French braziers move more smoothly and hold the road better than the Mercedes with their undamped springs. It's not easy to appreciate the drama of seeing the giants for the first time. To liken a locomotive to a car, says one account, is sheer bathos. It is as the gamboling of an elephant to the flight of a swallow. It's a shock to the Germans when Thierry's brazier is found to be fastest of all and steadily drawing away from Janetsky. Britain is close behind. Italy is also coming into the picture with Canio's Fiat number 17. It is reported that when other drivers wave, Canio, the chauffeur, salutes respectfully. Lap after lap for nearly six hours, Terry keeps up his magnificent drive. Janetzi cannot match the fantastic regularity of the French car. At long last, the Gordon Bennett Trophy goes back to France. From now onwards, Terry is to be known as the chronometer. The following year, he wins again. And now France exploits her supremacy by organizing a new race on her own terms. The French Grand Prix is to be a two-day affair of 800 miles, the finest possible test of men and machines. There are new Fiat's from Italy and Mercedes from Germany. Designers still concentrate on large engines in light chassis. The 14 and a half liter Mercedes engine is just about twice as big as that of a London bus. Hotchkiss have gone so far as to fit light wire wheels. There isn't even a cushion for the driver of this car as it is officially weighed. The De Dietrich are probably near the ton weight limit with their 18 liter engines. Clement's son Albert is having his first big race on 13A, a Clement Bayard. Numbers are allocated to makes. 5A is a brazier, so are 5B and 5C. There are no less than 23 French cars among the starters. Gabriel leads off for France. Lancia of Italy is on a Fiat. That's a new Renault. To make this race a test of men as well as machines, all work must now be done by the crew. This is just the start of a two-day race. The circuit is made up of three very long, flat-out straights. It is above all a test of sustained high speed. Although there are the connecting corners. Organization is on the grand scale with 40 miles of palisading alone. As the first results come through, a brazier is again in the lead with Barra driving. While the leading Hotchkiss has broken a wheel on the first lap. Lancia, the hope of Italy, comes in. A keen singer, he is said to detect a false note in an engine as easily as in one of his favorite Wagnerian scores. The entire radiator seems to be out of harmony today. The Italas are also off tune. And it is Seitz who takes the lead for France with a Renault. Braziers are second and third. The heat is becoming subtropical, but already the French lead is overwhelming. 
The first day's racing is more than halfway through when LeBlanc finishes rebuilding his wheel with spokes borrowed, it is said, not only from his wheels, but even from other competitors. This is becoming a real test of physical endurance. The fine particles of dust combine with the dust-laying liquid to hurt the driver's eyes so severely that several can hardly see the road and have to retire. Just before midday, the waiting crowd see the leader come in. In first place sits the ex-mechanic. And second, the youngest competitor, Albert Clément. Next morning, the race is continued. Sitz leads comfortably, but the complete French victory crumbles as the Italian driver, Felice Nazaro, takes second place. Young Albert's in trouble. He has to change tires on fixed wheels, whereas the Fiat's and Huenos have detachable rims. Sitz's car is not only fast, but he can change a tire in two minutes, compared with up to 15 minutes of this. Poor Albert Clément is dropping further and further behind the Italian Fiat. The wooden road, specially built to skirt the town of Saint Calais, is tricky. Shepard, an American amateur, was fourth. Albert's back, trying to catch the Fiat. While a brazier is now fourth. The American is out. Another wire wheel has collapsed. And there just don't seem to be enough spokes left on any of the others. Today, no one can catch the Renault. And Sitz waves to the crowd as he drives on with a lead of over 30 minutes on Nazaro. The first Grand Prix is in every way a success for France. The Renault wins, while Nazaro's second place for Italy in the Fiat gives a pleasant international flavor. There is a new racing star, an ex-racing mechanic. The professionals are moving in. Germany counters the successful French Grand Prix by putting all her imperial splendor behind a race of her own, the Kaiser Prize. A large number of people still have little apparent idea of the danger involved, which is a big problem on these long circuits. Many who should know better still turn their back on the motor car's rapid progress. This time, Germany has drawn up regulations on her terms, excluding the large French and Italian Grand Prix cars. All the same, there is a strong competition from abroad, and for half the 300-mile race, a Belgian fleet leads. Then, on the very last lap, Felici Nazaro comes through to win on his red Italian Fiat. The unlucky Belgian finds that he is now nearly five minutes behind. Germany can do no better than third. The race is not repeated. The Kaiser presents the prizes, not only to the drivers and to the designers, but also to the directors of the companies involved. Right on top of this comes the French Grand Prix at Dieppe. The weight limit was dangerous, and the organizers have hit on a depressingly sensible formula, a limit on fuel consumption. It's all done most carefully, but motor racing is spectacular, particularly with flamboyant characters in the German and Italian teams, with the hard-driving Lancia, and that most brilliant new star of all, Felici Nazaro.
the son of a Turin coal merchant who is said to handle a car like a violin. To economize the limited fuel, cars are started at the last moment, and several are in trouble. As soon as the race is on, all thoughts of careful economical driving are forgotten. The new formula hasn't had much effect. Two drivers have been killed in practice on these giant lightweights. One of them, young Albert Clément. Many drivers are finding the new circuit difficult. Racing encourages new and experimental cars. But this veteran, Cobrombrie, is in her fifth season. It is not a Mercedes year. And the braziers now seem to be outclassed. Italy has taken the lead. It's Wagner on a Fiat, and he's overdone it. His lead was less than seven seconds over Dure's French Lorraine Dietrich. Pablo on a brazier is trying hard. A Renault is touched by the brazier. Pablo has bent the front axle, but the car is drivable. It's a Lorraine Dietrich leading for France, but Lancia's Fiat is only seconds behind. Felice Nazaro, with a gentlemanly salute, is third. The speed of this car is understandable. Like several others, they're finding the detachable rims too detachable. Racing has become tougher and more professional, but it's still usually friendly. It's traditional to try and finish, even after losing two and a half hours. With a fabulous drive on the Lorraine Dietrich, Dure still leads for France. But the pace is now telling on Lancia's Fiat. French cars are second and third. With only two laps to go, Dure is out. And first place has been taken for Italy by Felici Nazaro on his Fiat. Felici, the winner of the Kaiser Prize, wins the French Grand Prix. The next Grand Prix is again at Dieppe and starts with a bang. Solzer immediately takes the lead for Germany and loses it but it's depressingly clear to the French crowd that this year the white German cars are very fast and a Benz now leads. There's no fuel limit this year, but a minimum weight limit of just over one ton. The idea of the minimum weight is that heavier cars will be safer. Unfortunately, Heavy cars have a strong tendency to keep moving in a straight line. The German cars are overwhelmingly successful, although even Lautenschlager on the leading Mercedes makes his mistake. Lautenschlager still has a lead of eight minutes when he goes on to win.
German cars are first, second, and third. The race is a complete German victory, and the defeat of France is hard to take. This might well be the end of the French Grand Prix, but motor racing is not dead. Opened in 1907, gives a great impetus to British manufacturers with its opportunities for sustained high speed. Percy Lambert's Talbot is the first car to do 100 miles in the hour. Track racing is also popular in the States, where trotting tracks are used for regular meetings. One British writer refers to this as a most unsafe procedure. In Europe, it's more gentlemanly. Even if it's not quite the thing to put your passenger nearest to the accident. Amateur sport is always popular in Britain, and at Chelsley Walsh, almost anyone can have a go. But it isn't just fun, and many useful lessons are learnt the hard way. Observe the stability of this car. Now compare a Leon Peugeot, a fast car with a high engine and centre of gravity. These small cars, called voiturettes, are being highly developed. At first, people looked down on them, saying they should be kept for shopping and local touring. There is an air of the more cheerful British amateur racing of the day, as one of the crew dives beneath a seat, produces a magneto, and looks as if he doesn't know quite what to do next. This way of spending your time demands real enthusiasm. The sheer guts of these men is realized when we see how they try to go on racing whenever possible. Surprisingly few people are seriously hurt. However, one accident at Encore Bridge has become legend. lifted from the wreck to be taken to the mortuary. When the driver was placed on the cold slab, he is said to have risen up and indignantly demanded his motor car. By 1908, this voiturette is winning a 300-mile race in under six hours non-stop. Louis Delage appears to have bashed by his sudden fame to thank Guillaume. Less happy is the Grand Prix story. The death of one of the great pioneers, Maurice Fournier, mars a gallant attempt to revive Grand Prix racing at Le Mans in 1911. Unluckily, only number 13, a Fiat, completes the full distance. However, Grand Prix racing is to return the following year with new giant Fiats from Italy. French Peugeots with engines of only half their size and valuable experience from their voiturette racing. The British sunbeams are much smaller still. It's quite like old times as a giant Fiat goes into the lead round the old Dieppe circuit. There is drama again at Encore Bridge. The racing, however, is different. The smaller Peugeots are setting a new standard in road holding. While the three-litre sunbeams come in third, fourth, and fifth. Louis Wagner's Fiat is second. But it and all the other giants have been decisively defeated by a blue Peugeot. The driver, Georges Boileau, becomes overnight one of the legendary figures of motor racing. In 1913, the Peugeot engine is reduced further in size, and Boileau is the star driver. Moreover, on the new short 20-mile circuit at Amiens, the road holding of the Peugeot and the skill of Boileau are at a premium. The challenge comes from Delage. One of these new round-nosed cars laps at over 76. 
British sunbeams are again well up, and one finishes third. It is the Peugeot road holding that defeats all others. Another brilliant drive by Georges Boileau brings a second victory to France. French confidence grows as a race for Grand Prix cars at Le Mans gives the Delage a chance to prove themselves. To the excitement of everyone, the Mercedes are back. But the white German cars cannot catch the French. Pablo wins. This time, Louis Delage isn't so bashful. The French industry is right back on top as the stage is set for the last act of our story the 1914 French Grand Prix. This is to be one of the greatest motor races of all time, with cars from nearly every motor manufacturing company in the world. Sits, the ex-mechanic is back. So is Canio, the royal chauffeur. Felici Nazaro with the sensitive hands. And most exciting of all, Lautenschlager on a new Mercedes is meeting the great George Boileau on his Peugeot. The new circuit is near Lyon, and for additional spectacle, the cars are to start in pairs. See how Siler's white Mercedes walks away from Cagno. At the end of the first lap, it is George Boileau of France who leads the pack. Then, to the dismay of the crowd, a white German Mercedes is fastest of all. Siler leads, Boileau is second, on that dramatic day in the summer of 1914, the crowd line the short, twisting 23-mile circuit. This is a real test of a racing car and of the engineering skill of the nations involved. The German car leads, but French cars are close behind. Boileau is second, and number 35, Durez de Large, is third. The British and Italian cars are behind, battling among themselves, when suddenly, after only six of the 25 laps, Seiler and a second Mercedes are out. Boileau leads, and another Peugeot 19 is fourth. The blue Peugeots, with their tails cocked high, seem to gain yards on every corner. Pablo's de large number nine cannot match the Peugeot's. Then the three remaining Mercedes start coming through the field, and the race is nearly halfway through when Lautenschlager comes into second place. Boileau has never tried harder to win. Only 10 laps to go, and he leads by nearly two and a half minutes. Then, in the last laps, tension grows. The crowd realize that the Mercedes are steadily gaining ground. The final lap, and as the cars stream home, the blue car is missing. Boileau's out. Lautenschlager wins with Mercedes first, second, and third. The German victory is complete. The heroic days of the pioneers are over. But the great racing cars will never be forgotten. The fragile but powerful cars that demanded so much strength, physical endurance, and courage as men raced with them over hundreds of miles of dusty roads half a century ago.
these are cars of the 20s, unique in the skill and craftsmanship that went into the construction. Fortunes were spent preparing and racing them. The First World War had ended and long-lasting peace with unlimited prosperity seemed to lie ahead. These are cars of the golden age of motor racing. Only seven months after the armistice, Marshal Foch is talking with Louis Chevrolet at the Indianapolis 500 miles victory sweepstakes. A few hastily assembled new cars and many leftovers bring motor racing back again. It's a tough race with a number of mechanical failures and accidents. Three men are killed. Bellows, which had been designed and built at a cost of some $120,000, are disappointing. Luckily, Chazanne is not seriously hurt. The race is won on a French Peugeot, owned and stored during the war by the American Speedway and driven by Howdy Wilcox. Next year, all their large cars will be obsolete, for the maximum engine size is to be almost cut by half. The great American sports boom has started. Tommy Milton, driving this Duesenberg at over 156 miles an hour, joins Jack Dempsey, Babe Ruth, and Bobby Jones. Gaston Chevrolet and his brother also have new American cars for the 500. All have three-liter engines, the size set for the still non-existent French Grand Prix. French hopes are high, with Chazanne, Thomas, and Dio, and goo. Besides new eight-cylinder bellows, which have already proved to be the fastest cars here. It is Joe Boyer on one of the Chevrolet cars in the lead. But the Chevrolet cars run into serious trouble. They have faulty steering arms. It looks like a certain win for a bellow, driven by the American ace De Palma. Only 14 laps to go, and it's De Palma's mechanic. He seems to have run out of petrol. No, it's a faulty magneto. But although he gets going, he's lost the lead. Bellow has just failed to achieve his great ambition, to win a major race for France. Gaston Chevrolet has the first win on an American-built car since 1912 and well over $36,000 in his pocket. This summer, motor racing starts again in France with cycle cars. They start in pairs and there is little room for overtaking. It is a brave effort, but the roads of France have been devastated by years of war. Once again, the people of Europe see the victory of man over machine. It is a battering for both. And a sturdy little two-stroke major that carries Violet and his large mechanic to victory. A team of French Bugattis is in the light car race next day. These cars, with their pear-shaped radiators, are so much faster that at least one rival is lapped twice by a Bugatti before he has got round once. It is a cheering return to racing for France and for Bugatti. Henry Ford is at Indianapolis to see De Palma try again with the bellow. But it is Tommy Milton who wins on another of the Chevrolet cars. Now the moment has arrived for the first post-war French Grand Prix, and De Palma has come to Europe to drive in the Ballot team. The greatest of international motoring events is once again at Le Mans. 
armor goes off well, but the beautifully prepared white and blue American Duesenbergs are equally fast. The hydraulic brakes on their cars prove a great innovation, and the American drivers take to road racing with gusto. Then at 12 laps, Jean Chazanne on a ballot tries to snatch the lead for France. He succeeds, and there is an epic battle between the blue French car and the Americans. It's all very sporting. Nobody gives an inch. No less than 14 tyres were changed by one newcomer, Seagrave, desperately keen to win his place with a British team. The few remaining cars hold together, and it's an American Duesenberg that comes in first at an average of over 78, driven by Jimmy Murphy. De Palma is second, Ballo has just lost a game to the Americans. When the enterprising junior car club organizes a race for light cars at Brooklands, Seagrave is an established member of the Sunbeam Talbot Derrick team. The one cunningly creeping forward is Malcolm Campbell. Seagrave's team manager is certain of success and planned that Bill Lee Guinness should come in first but the ambitious young Seagrave disapproves of rigging races and comes through. It's his first big win, and all is forgiven. <laughs> Strasbourg. The French Grand Prix is here again with a two-litre limit. The race is due to start at 8 a.m. after a pouring wet night. Seagrave has had his new sunbeam specially painted in Germany. Italy is back with Felice Nazaro, the pre-war champion, on a Fiat. This is the first ever mass start of a Grand Prix, and it's Felice Nazaro in the lead. It's Fiat, Bugatti, Roland Pila, Ballo, Fiat, Sunbeam, Bugatti. A real battle between nations, and only the start of a 500-mile race. Nazaro, who used to drive the giant Edwardian cars so well, is proving just as much at home with these far smaller cars and their highly stressed engines. holding of the Fiat is outstanding, and they are soon well out in front. This little Aston Martin, with only a one and a half litre engine, puts up a brilliant show until Count Zborowski runs into magneto trouble. Bugattis haven't yet got the road holding for which they are to become famous. Fiat's are outclassing all other cars today and are now first, second, and third. Here's Goose Ballo. Ballo has been unlucky again. His brave venture is coming to an end. However, worse is to happen to the Fiat team. A Fiat loses a rear wheel, and Nazaro's young nephew, Biagio, is killed. Evidently, the rear axle isn't strong enough, and to prove this, the same thing happens to Bordino's car. Let's not forget the riding mechanics who took such risks with little glory. Meanwhile, the axle is still holding on Nazaro's car, and he leads the race, unaware of the tragedy. 
Nazaro wins for Italy, averaging just under 80 for over six and a quarter hours. It is said that after the race, a rear wheel fell off his car on being tapped with a mallet. Nearly an hour later, two Bugattis come in to take second and third places. Nazaro's sensational win and Fiat's return to racing cost £100,000. But they have set a new standard in racing car design. Indeed, this French Grand Prix finds new sunbeams looking remarkably like last year's winning Fiat. Bugatti remains individual in design. The latest Fiat's are again a sensation. Their secret is supercharging, and it is the first appearance of supercharged cars in the Grand Prix. Fiat Enterprise isn't rewarded. All their cars drop out, stones and grit wrecking the superchargers. The tremendous pace has caused havoc. Late in the race, very much to his surprise, Seagrave, who had been slowed in the early stages with a slipping clutch, finds himself the first British driver to win the French Grand Prix. Much to his disgust, he is given a glass of champagne, which he always disliked, but there isn't any water available. The Germans are in Sicily with a team of supercharged Mercedes. They are returning to racing with Dr. Ferdinand Porsche as chief engineer. They are up against several works teams and a vast private hispano suiza Races can be lost and won by pit work. One of the Mercedes team today is a man called Neubauer, who is hoping to make his name as a racing driver. He will do no better than 15th in this race, but he will become the most famous team manager in the world. The race is won by Werner on a Mercedes, but the Germans are not invited to the French Grand Prix. There's a new Italian team at Lyon, Alfa Romeo with the famous P2, and they have one of the great drivers of all time, Antonio Ascari. The driver of number 19 is Enzo Ferrari. Bordino again has a Fiat. As expected, a Sunbeam takes the lead. They are the fastest cars here today. It is Seagrave on number one. Then the sunbeam starts to misfire mysteriously, and Bordino takes the lead. Then Ascari leads on an alpha. The strain on men and machines is tremendous. 500 miles at an average of over 70. Seven hours with little chance of relaxing for a second. The race is halfway through when another green car goes into the lead. It is Bill Lee Guinness. Seagrave, way behind in race order, is holding formation. But sunbeams are out of luck. Lee Guinness loses a tire tread, and Seagrave is plagued all day by a faulty magneto. Ascari comes back into the lead. Then, in the very last stages, his car refuses to start after a pit stop, and his teammate, Campari, wins on another Alpha. Giuseppe Campari hasn't Seagrave's dislike of alcohol. In the Italian Grand Prix, Ascari and the Alpha team come in first, second, third, and fourth. Improved Alphas are in Belgium for the Grand Prix, but France has produced a yet more powerful car, the 12-cylinder Delage with its twin superchargers.
past year, there were many fatal accidents and riding mechanics are now banned. The Delages are fast, but have teething troubles. Alphas win again with the great Ascari at the top of his form. Ascari comes to Montlieri for the French Grand Prix. quarter distance, Antonio Ascari does his last lap. On a fast bend, his car leaves the road and one of the greatest of all drivers is killed. The other alphas are withdrawn as a mark of respect. This is the first time France has won her Grand Prix for over 10 years, but it is a hollow victory for Delage and for Robert Benoist, who with characteristic chivalry will place his winner's garlands on the wreckage of Ascari's car. This film of the alpha team is taken in France before the tragic race. And here is one last look at the great Antonio Ascari. Their hero is dead as the crowds flock to Monza to see the swan song of the P2 Alpha. Next year, a new formula will reduce Grand Prix engines to one and a half litres. Bugatti has come to Italy with his team. His cars have a beauty and craftsmanship that will always be loved and cherished but he obstinately refuses to supercharge, giving them far less power than their rivals. The Duesenbergs are being driven by Peter Kreiss and Tommy Milton. Sunbeams have given up. Britain has only one privately entered Eldridge. The Alpha team include Campari and Count Vili Perry. Last minute instructions include how to work the flag. As the last seconds tick away, someone stands in front of the camera, and they're off. Again, the P2 Alphas are out in front, although for one lap, Peter Christ takes the lead for America. For a short, exciting time, Tommy Milton gets within striking distance, only to drop back later. Billy Perry's pit work is rapid. It's still limited to the driver and one mechanic, although he no longer rides. Billy Perry is taking the lead. Campari lost time. It's a win for Billy Perry. Campari brings another P2 into second place. The very successful two-litre formula is ending. It has been dominated by Italy, first with Fiat's and then Alphas. The light car races have seen the invincible Talbot sweep home time after time. is one hitch. Right at the end of a race at Montlieri, when Count Canelli challenges his teammate. He crossed the line upside down. It's a wasted effort. George Duller wins, and the Count is second with a few bruises and explanations to give his team manager. The new formula, and a French Grand Prix with only three cars. Reduced to one and a half litre engines, Bugatti has given in and fitted superchargers, but there is no competition. Until now, there has been little spectacle in sports car racing. A limit on fuel consumption tended to cut down speed. Although it was all taken very seriously, with technical experts to help and plenty of skilled supervision. Every part of the cars got the same rigorous testing. It's the racing that just hasn't the real Grand Prix atmosphere. That 
days until a sports car race at Le Mans. The 24-hour Grand Prix d'Endurance captures everyone's imagination. This is real motor racing with cars that can be used for family outings. Even the hoods must be put up for the opening laps. It's a major international event with British Bentleys and French Lorraine Dietrichs competing for high honours. Lorraine Dietrichs come in first, second and third, giving an overwhelming victory to France. Motor racing in the States is different. There is no shortage of spectacle, but it is more of a demonstration of human courage than of automobile engineering. However, it isn't just a circus. Track racing does develop high-speed cars. At Indianapolis, there's a win at just over 100 for Peter De Paolo in a supercharged Duesenberg. The Miller is also an advanced design, and here's another famous winner, Frank Lockhart. By August, Grand Prix racing is reviving in Europe, and there's a team of new one and a half litre Delages for the RAC Brooklyn's Grand Prix. The new cars have teething troubles, but they are good enough to win all the same. The new formula isn't applied in Germany. And this Grand Prix might have been forgotten if it wasn't for number 14, a privately entered Mercedes driven by a young car salesman, Rudy Caracciola. Number 14 has stalled. This is the chance the young enthusiast begged for, and he is already left behind. Then on the fifth lap, it begins to rain. Adolf Rosenberger on a second Mercedes crashes while in the lead. Urban Emmerich then leads and also crashes. Fantastically, however, the rain has not slowed Rudy Caracciola and a completely unknown driver wins a Grand Prix. There is growing public interest in the world's land speed record. The first man to reach 150 miles an hour officially is Malcolm Campbell with a sunbeam. Seagrave now takes the record by a small margin. A month later, Paddy Thomas, a gifted engineer and designer, puts the record up by nearly 20 miles an hour with his aero-engined car, Babs. A great battle is now on to be the first man to reach three miles a minute. In January, Campbell arrives at Pendine with a completely new car, the Napier Campbell Bluebird. He takes the record, but just fails to reach the magic 180. On Thursday, the 3rd of March, Paddy Thomas is feeling better after a bout of flu and decides to make his bed. On the first two runs, Babs is fast, but not fast enough. On the third, she is seen to be smoking. One of the great individuals of motor racing is dead. Meanwhile, in Florida, all the ballyhoo of the time is underway. Seagrave's new Sunbeam has two aero engines. In such a car, the tires can only be guaranteed for a life of three and a half minutes flat out. His speed, both ways, works out at over 203 miles an hour. President Dumergue and Monsieur Brion are at Montlieri for the French Grand Prix.
Faced with the now fabulous Delage, Bugatti has withdrawn his works team and the entry is small. The Talbots are fast, but they do not stand the pace. The day finishes with Delage's first, second and third. No wonder Louis Delage is pleased as he poses with Chamberlain and Levine, the latest flyers across the Atlantic. The winner is Robert Benoist, a man who drove and lived with courage and enthusiasm. During the war, he died as a leader of the resistance. He is driving the only Delage to compete against the latest front drive Miller in the Italian Grand Prix. On a wet road, Benoist averages over 90 to win by 22 minutes. He has started in five races this year and won them all. Women are now proving that they can be as fast as most men. Some women motorists achieve great fame. This winner of a Grand Prix d'honneur is called Miss Danguette. The holiday meetings at Brooklands are also great fun. You may see Kay Don with one of the last of the Grand Prix sunbeams. Or a Benz, alleged to have been Hindenburg's staff car in the Kaiser War. Just look how the ancient Benz leaves behind two modern sports cars. And if you had all that worked out, you may even take some money home. Britain has always been the home of amateurs, and at Brooklands they can all have a go. While on the continent, a champion motorcyclist, Nuvolari, has just bought a Bugatti like many other Italians. This is the heyday of Bugattis, and they are raced all over Europe by wealthy amateurs as well as professionals. This Rome Grand Prix isn't Nuvolari's lucky day, although he won last year. For the fourth time running, a Bugatti comes in first. The driver this time is the debonair Louis Chiron. The green British Bentleys won at Le Mans last year, and they are being challenged by a Black Hawk Stutz and four Chryslers from America. The Bentley boys are becoming a legend, and this time it's Wolf Bonato, the prodigious millionaire, who wins. Bernard Rubin is on the right. There never has been anything like motor racing to demonstrate the effectiveness of the latest developments in automobile engineering. One of the most revolutionary cars of all appears in the last year of the 20s, the Golden Arrow. Seagrave is out to regain the land speed record from the American Ray Keach, who raised it 207. is shattered by nearly 24 miles an hour. Seagrave has joined Lindbergh as one of the international heroes of the time. He is the first man to be knighted for a motoring achievement, and among the telegrams is one from His Majesty King George V.